This is day seven of me building and launching a tech startup from scratch in 90 days. And last week, I really wanted to figure out how most successful entrepreneurs actually come up with profitable business ideas, which I did. So in this video, I'll be sharing six different strategies they recommend for brainstorming ideas. And I'll also share the idea that I've come up with using one of these six strategies. Oh, and if you're new to the series and don't know who I am, I'm Addy and I'm attempting to build and launch a tech startup from scratch in 90 days with no prior experience. And in my last video, I shared a seven step plan that I'm following to launch this business, which basically accounts for me not knowing anything about starting a business at all. And we're currently finishing up step one of that plan. So if you'd like to learn more about what this mystery plan is, I'll leave a link in the description to that video. Right, so back to these six strategies that I discovered for coming up with profitable business ideas. The first strategy is to reframe your mindset to basically view problems as opportunities. And I think there's an absolutely amazing story to basically explain what this means. So in 2011, Isha Ambani was a student at Yale and she basically flew back to Mumbai to visit her family for the holidays. And during that time, she was trying to submit her coursework through her university's online portal. But she couldn't do that because the internet speed at their house was really terrible. She got so frustrated that she literally went up to her dad and said that the internet in their house just sucks. Now after hearing someone complain, you and I would probably try to console that person and then move on with our day. But her dad, Mukesh Ambani, who is basically one of the most wealthiest people on this planet with a net worth of over 100 billion US dollars, basically saw that complaint from his daughter as an opportunity to fix the underlying telecommunications infrastructure in India. So in 2016, he launched Geo, which is basically a company that was able to completely transform India's telecommunications landscape by basically making high-speed internet accessible to millions of Indians, all while slashing data prices by a huge margin. So the point that I'm basically trying to make is that by reframing your mindset, the next time you hear someone complain about something, you just might be presented with the next million dollar business opportunity. Moving on to strategy number two, and it's called the customer first approach. Now with this approach for coming up with a business idea, you basically start off by defining an ideal avatar for the type of customer you'd like to build a business for. So for example, maybe 30 to 40 year old single moms with one or two kids that work corporate jobs. From there, you basically interview these individuals and do a bunch of research to try and find problems that they face in their lives. So maybe after speaking to 30 of these single moms, you basically find out that a huge pain point for them is that they all need to wake up really early and rush home after work just so that they can prepare healthy, nutritionally balanced meals for their children. And you know, they've tried meal delivery services and decided that they don't work because the ingredients aren't fresh or maybe the dishes aren't kid friendly. And that's when you basically put two and two together and realize that you can create a business around this. So maybe the idea you come up with is to build an app that basically allows these moms to hire culinary students or chefs or other home cooks to come home and meal prep fresh, healthy, nutritionally balanced meals for their kids, maybe once or twice a week. And because you basically have done all the research there is to do about this avatar, you have a rough idea about how much they're even willing to spend on this app. Moving on, technique number three is to basically solve your own problems. So this technique is pretty similar to the customer first approach, but instead of designing an ideal avatar to build a business around, you're the ideal avatar. And you basically build a product or a business that solves a problem in your life that you wouldn't mind spending money on. And there are basically a few questions that you can ask yourself to find these problems that you can create business ideas from. So for example, what's something that regularly frustrates you every single day? What's something that's been on your to-do list for a really long time that you keep putting off? What's something that you regularly fail to do well and why? Or what's something that you wish you could buy but no one else has made it yet? So if you can find an answer to any of these questions, you will probably be able to figure out an idea for a business. But there's one general rule of thumb with this, which is that you want to try and identify a problem in your life that 
isn't easy to solve because the harder the problem is, the more likely people are going to be willing to actually pay for it to be solved for them. But once you basically find a problem, try to solve it for yourself first and then refine the solution continuously until you're able to create a product or a business around it. Technique number four is to basically build a business around your hobbies. As this technique suggests, this basically involves turning your hobbies or interests into a potential source of business ideas. And the reason this might actually be a great thing to do is that you've probably already invested thousands of hours into your hobbies. So you literally know everything there is to know about it, including all the problems that other people face when partaking in this hobby. So for example, Maybe you're a hiker who loves to explore new trails, but you've noticed that quite a lot of these trails lack reliable, up-to-date information about the trail conditions or the difficulty levels, which basically makes it really easy for beginners to either get lost or hurt. So maybe the idea you come up with is an app that provides real-time updates for different trails to hikers of different experience levels. Or maybe you're really into baking and you've really perfected a unique recipe for gluten-free cooking cookies that taste exactly like regular cookies. You could turn this hobby into a business by starting maybe a specialty bakery or an online store where you sell these gluten-free creations. So the key here is to basically use your knowledge of your hobby to identify a unique problem that you could solve. But it's important to note that just because you enjoy something as a hobby doesn't automatically mean that it'll translate into a successful business. You still need to go through all the trouble of actually validating your idea and ensuring that there's you know, an actual demand for what you're offering. Moving on to technique number five, which is to come up with a business idea based off your professional expertise. So for this technique, you literally use a unique skill or a piece of knowledge that you've acquired during your professional career and build a product or a service around that. So maybe you're a tax accountant and as part of your job, you've figured out how to reduce the amount of tax that 30 to 40 year old doctors pay by maybe 10%. That piece of knowledge right there is gold and you can literally use that to start a side hustle. Another example is if you're a software engineer who has developed a unique algorithm for optimizing a database query by 50%. You could totally create a consulting service or a software tool that helps companies improve their database performance using this algorithm that you've developed. But the key here is to leverage your specialized knowledge to create value for others who face similar challenges in their work. Now, technique number six is for when all else fails and you really can't think of a single problem to build a business around, and it's to improve an existing product or a service. So you start off by making a list of five to 10 products that you use regularly. And for each product, you start listing improvements that could be made to them. Let's say that one of those 10 products is a to-do list app that you use to keep track of what you need to do during the day. But the biggest problem is that you sometimes have so many things on your list that you either don't know what to work on next, or you need to keep pushing back tasks to the next day whenever you can't complete them. So what if you built a better to-do list app that is able to prioritize your tasks for you and tell you exactly what tasks to work on next? And even better, like what if this app is able to learn when you're most productive during the week and automatically schedule tasks for you based on that information? Another example could be improving a fitness app. Now, even though there are hundreds or maybe even thousands of fitness apps out there, you might notice that most of them only focus on cardio and strength training, but they all neglect mobility and flexibility exercises. So maybe you can build on top of that and create an app that focuses a lot more on stretching and mobility routines. But the point of this technique is to basically leverage products or services that already exist so that you don't have to worry about coming up with something completely new from the ground up. And you can instead focus on improving existing products or services that are already making money. Okay, so those were the six strategies for coming up with profitable business ideas that I came across during my research. And of all those six strategies, there was one that really stood out to me. And it was basically to solve a problem or a frustration that I'm dealing with in my life. So a while ago, I released this video, which is a CSS coding challenge. And if you've watched the video, you'd notice that the editing for this video is pretty simple. All I do is share my screen as I code and I talk about all the code changes that I'm making. 
and because of the simplicity of the video, when I was done filming, I was pretty confident that I'd be able to edit the entire video in just maybe two or three hours, even though the raw footage was over an hour long. But instead of taking me just a few hours, it actually took me over a week to fully edit this video. And during that week, I spent about two hours every single day working on this video. Now, maybe I'm a terrible editor, which is why it took me so long, but I just remember feeling so frustrated during this week because all I was doing was repetitive, laborious editing to the point where I just wanted to pay someone to get the job done. And that's when it struck me. There are millions of creators out there and every single one of them has to probably do some form of editing before uploading their videos online, which means that quite a lot of them probably go through the same level of frustration that I went through while editing that video. So I did some digging around and sure enough, I came across so many Reddit posts of people complaining about video editing and how soul sucking it can be. And that's when it struck me. What if I could build a tool that handles all of the laborious editing tasks that creators typically hate when using traditional editing software, allowing them to actually focus on more creative aspects of editing that really showcase their personality and style. And if built right, this tool has the potential of saving creators thousands of hours during their creative journey, allowing them to, you know, upload more frequently and upload better quality content. And that's all I'll say about this idea for now, because I still want to keep the actual shape of the product a secret until it's ready to launch. But when I came across this idea, I was pretty excited. And I, for one, know that even if this tool isn't profitable at the end of these 90 days, I'd personally still continue using it. So at the very least, it would be extremely useful to me and solve a problem in my life. So yeah, this marks the end of phase one of my seven step plan. And in the next episode, we'll be jumping on to phase number two, which is the pre-execution step. 